Thank you, Robin. Uh, ooh, somebody's lost my pictures. <laughs> what I wanted to say in this slide that corals, it's, it's hard work being a coral reef. You need to continuously make skeleton out of calcium carbonate in order to produce the massive structure in which these other organisms live. You're constantly being pounded by waves, messed up by tropical cyclones. You've got sunshine, you've got predators, and you've got coral eaters. We're now more frequently seeing the skeleton of coral reefs through a process which is a direct result of global warming, where we're seeing increased thermal stress on coral reefs. Corals are bleaching, losing their algae, and you see the white calcium carbonate skeleton. How unusual are these environmental changes and impacts on coral reefs? We can actually now view and measure the marine world in unprecedented detail with satellites, with uh, thermometers we leave out on the reefs, weather stations, and we can do it in real, real time. But instrumental records only really go back to the 19th century. In the top left, you can see a familiar picture describing global warming. But what we want to see now is what happened before that. And we look at natural or human documents that provide a history of what's gone on before that. The top picture, which I don't think many of you will be able to read, is the, Jap the Chinese were able to reconstruct rainfall in China back to the 15th century, essentially from the tax returns that people were sending in. They didn't believe one person, but when 100 people said, we can't pay our taxes because of a flood, it, you took it for truth. People are more familiar with trees and also ice cores. Massive corals also record the past. Here we can see the white calcium carbonate skeleton. If you look at the lower left-hand side, you see a tiny dark layer on the outside edge. That's the living tissue layer. That's where the coral makes the coral skeleton. And to actually see what's going on in the skeleton. We turn to medical techniques. We subject our corals to x-rays and even now to CT scans. And when you do that, you can see a series of dark and light bands. These are annual growth bands. Each year the coral's laying down a high density part of skeleton and a low density. So you have a chronology. You can go back into the past. The bottom picture is a core taken from a small colony that was apparently healthy, but we can see in that growth record a dark black line, which is where the coral slowed its growth during the 1998 bleaching event. So we can get information from these hiatuses in growth. I don't do the hard work of actually collecting corals. This involves taking professional divers out, skilled divers who are working from a drill rig, and removing coral cores. In fact, there's an example of one of our cores in the Endeavour exhibition next door. I should say, when we take the cores out, we put a special plug in the hole, and the coral tissue will grow back over it. So we're fairly user-friendly. On the Great Barrier Reef, corals have told us a lot about what's gone on in the past. They've told us about more common growth hiatuses, there's been evidence of a recent decline, a slowing of coral growth, more variable rainfall since the late 19th century. Malcolm will be telling you about what the effects of European settlement were that are recorded in corals, and also that water temperatures have got warmer. We have an extensive collection of aims of corals from up and down the Great Barrier Reef. Over the past couple of years, we've turned our attention to Western Australia, it's a very different sort of reef system. It's not a barrier reef system, but we've been targeting the isolated reefs and some of the nearshore reefs to understand what's going on there. And I just want to give you sort of four brief examples. The first one, which I call the French Connection. This is a coral from Clerk Reef, which is about 17 degrees south. It's growing very slowly, and I estimated it started growing about 1770. Two years later, the French claimed Western Australia for King Louis XV. And if things had gone otherwise, I might be speaking to you in French and we might be celebrating the French Academy of Sciences. By the time Matthew Flinders 
sailed past, this coral was probably about 25 centimeters high. It's now 2.5 meters high, and basically that coral has lived through, has growth records going through all the way through the Industrial Revolution to the present day. This, not all reefs are nice and pretty with clear water. This is a place called Thevenard Island, and you can see it's very murky. There's very irregular banding, which is typical of corals in muddy water. And you can see towards the left-hand side a marked growth hiatus. And what we think has happened there is there was a tropical cyclone went through in the 1950s, and it either covered the coral in a lot of sediment or just disturbed its growth axis. It then, after a little while, recovered. This is the other side of Thevenard Island, which is closest to the mainland. And here we're not looking at an X-ray, we're looking at a coal placed under ultraviolet light, like a disco light. And you see these bright luminescent lines which relate to river floods. And we can see here indications of wet years and dry years. And the last story is from Tantabidi. They have wonderful names, the reefs across in Western Australia. This one's growing about eight millimeters a year. There's about 200 years of growth record. I'm only showing you the top section because it's, from my perspective, it's actually a very boring coral because every year looks exactly the same, apart from 1998, where there's a small growth hiatus. So this tells us, this history book tells us, that that coral lived very happily for 200, at least 200 years, and it's only a recent event that it's caused a problem with its growth. And it has recovered, so it was a fairly minor event. So, this is just the opening chapter, the preface to work that Ames will be doing in collaboration with people at the University of Western Australia into unraveling the histories of climate, water temperatures, ocean acidification, and the impacts of growth uh, resulting from, say, ocean acidification. And there are plenty more stories to come, and I would just like to thank Ames's underwater acrobatic team for providing those demonstrations. So thank you very much. <laughs>